will invite to the lectern one whose love dissolves all bondage and helps to bring us liberty, our dear beloved Reverend Anne Shand. Good morning, friends. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Maestro, Mrs. Chuck, for sharing the podium with me. And again, happy Friendship Day. And also a welcome to our extended family of friends joining us on the World Wide Web. This is indeed a significant day in our center's calendar. It is a day set aside to celebrate our friendships. On this day, we share our gifts of time, talent, treasure, abilities, attitudes, opinions, thoughts with our friends, persons on the same spiritual vibration, the same field of consciousness, and together we celebrate our unity with the eternal love of God, which incarnated us out of itself which makes us one family, children of God, joint heirs with Christ in God. From the introduction of Desmond Tutu's book, An African Prayer Book, I read, Adam was having the time of his life in the Garden of Eden. He enjoyed his work as a primal gardener. The animals loved him and lived in an idyllic, undisturbed harmony. Everything was lovely in the garden. No, not quite. God looked on his human creature and was concerned, for his life was not all unalloyed bliss. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And so God asked Adam to choose a mate for himself from among the animals, which paraded before him in procession. God would ask his human friend, what about this one? Adam would reply, not on your life, no thank you. And so God decided to put Adam to sleep and produce from his rib that delectable creature, Eve. And when Adam awoke, he exclaimed, wow, this is just what the doctor ordered. This story tells a fundamental truth about us, that we are made to live in a delicate network of interdependence with one another, with God, and with the rest of God's creation. We say in our African idiom, a person is a person through other persons. A solitary human being is a contradiction. A totally self-sufficient human being is ultimately subhuman. We are made for complementarity. I have gifts you do not. You have gifts that I do not, voila. So we need each other to become fully human, end of quote. We are in fact mirrors for each other. So on this special day, we celebrate our friends who mirror the humanity and divinity of ourselves. The Bhagavad, the Bhagavad I can never say this, thing. Bhagavad Gita, yes, reminds us, and I quote, he whose self is established in oneness, whose vision is everywhere, sees the self in all beings, and all beings in the self, end of quote. I remember Reverend John breaking down that word intimacy to into me, I see. But for the purpose of my thoughts which I share today, my breakdown is into you, I see me. Emerson, noted philosopher, in his essay on friendship states, but the sweet sincerity of joy and peace which I draw from this alliance with my brother's soul is the knot itself, where all nature and all thought is but the husk and the shell. Happy is the house that shelters a friend." End of quote. Let us look at that quote and pick out the messages. Firstly, a seed or nut carries the entire growth process of a plant. Within that nut is all the components necessary for the growth of a tree, from a tiny weed to those huge trees 
in rainforests or national parks that average over 250 feet in length. In fact, the Redwood National Park in California has the tallest tree, which has a length of 379 feet from a tiny little seed. So think about that knot of your friendship, your friendship with another person who you care for de deeply. That knot carries within it sincerity, joy, peace, unconditioned love, non-judgment, in fact, all the attributes of God, which is the sum total of an eternally lasting friendship. That not carries the information that directs the course of that friendship beyond even your physical presence together. For instance, if for some reason there is a choice to move away from physically engaging with each other, the effect of that friendship still remains a part of the consciousness of the connected individuals. The effects of the friendship form a lasting component of the psyche or consciousness of each individual, which from time to time surfaces as changes in behavior patterns throughout our journey on this earth plane. The word house in the latter part of the quote, I am going to take poetical license with and change to consciousness. So I'll repeat the statement. Happy is the consciousness that shelters a friend. One of the greatest stories of friendship may be found in the Bible. The friendship of David and Jonathan. That is found in the, um, the books 1st and 2nd Samuel. David, after the slaying of Goliath of the Philistines, became a warrior in King Saul of Israel's army. There was a great friendship between Jonathan. He was, in fact, King Saul's eldest son, and David. 1st Samuel 18, verse 1, it says, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul." End of quote. This affection was to endure throughout the lives of both men. Jonathan proved his devotion when he saved David's life, that, that is, from being killed by his father, King Saul, who hated David, as he felt his people of Israel loved David a great deal. The story is how he saved David's, Jonathan, how he saved David's life a second time. And it's taken from 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 32 to 42. And Jonathan answered, saw his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a, ja a javelin at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he grieved for David, because his father had done him shame. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him. And he said unto the lad, Run, find out now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. And the lad knew not, knew not anything only Jonathan and David the matter. The matter here is that earlier in a previous chapter, Jonathan and David designed an elaborate plan whereby Jonathan would shoot three arrows on the side of a particular field as if after a specified target, and then instructed the lad that was with him to find these arrows that were shot over his head to a designated area of a field where David was hiding in the fringes. The Lad would collect the arrows and take them back to Jonathan. This means it was safe for David to come out of hiding and speak to Jonathan. If the lad, however, did not find the arrows to take back to Jonathan, then David would leave the area and hide from King Saul. So back to the reading, verse 40. And Jonathan gave his artillery unto the lad and said unto him, Go carry them into the city. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another until David exceeded. 
And Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. End of the reading. Before I give the metaphysical ideas behind the story, I will share one thing that is taken from the book of 2 Samuel. After Jonathan and his father Saul had died, David became king. The promise Jonathan and David made to each other stood firm. Jonathan had a lame son, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth who was hidden away in an empty, barren house, which was what was left of Saul's estate after he died. If Mephibosheth was found, he would have been killed. So David sought the boy until he was found, and that boy became a part of David's household. That is real devotion, a consciousness that shelters a friend. The metaphysical ideas were taken from the Bible dictionary written by Fillmore. Jonathan symbolizes the aspect of the soul that in man's unfoldment tries to unite our will with love, two of our spiritual gifts. The will always has an affinity for divine love, which stands for David. Jonathan means Jehovah has given, which means he came from God. In other words, he stands for human affection and desire, for spiritual unfoldment and attainment of which divine love forms a part of. The shooting of arrows by Jonathan symbolizes the loving, protecting thoughts that emanate from our deep intrinsic unity with God, our soul, towards that which it yearns to serve and to keep from all harm. That gut feeling from deep within that gently advises us what direction to go, where to find things, and sometimes a deep feeling of abiding love. The boy who picked up the arrows symbolizes the outer activity in us that obeys and serves the executive power of the soul, Jonathan. The executive aspect of the soul is actually our willingness to adhere to spiritual laws and principles that govern life. One principle is that we love others as we love ourselves. Others does not stop at family, or friends, associates, but beyond to others who for some reason we are uncomfortable with. Our willingness to see beyond appearances and use the truth of our reality as our reference to see and think rightly. Yes, it takes courage to be willing to allow the presence of God to express and reveal itself through us. Joel Goldsmith puts it this way, and I quote, use me, let me be that place in consciousness, that which God flows to all those seeking God. Not seeking my personal power, but seeking God. Let me be the vehicle or the avenue through which God pours itself into expression for all men to utilize and receive until they themselves learn that all that I am, they are too. All that Christ is, I am. I in God, God in me. All one, children of God. And if children, heirs. And if heirs, joint heirs with Christ in God." End of quote. That is a consciousness that shelters all beings. A will that is always knowing good for all concerned. A will that motivates us to utilize our spiritual gifts and abilities to enrich the cosmos. A will that lets us actively express our faith, strength, wisdom, judgment in seeing the presence of God in all persons and events. A will that lets us actively express our love, our David quality, power, imagination, understanding, order, enthusiasm, renunciation, our ability to move our consciousness to a higher order of thought and to express more of the life of God within us. This determines our character, the development of our awareness of who we really are, centers of God consciousness. That is why God's will for us, as stated on page 269 of our text, says, 
anything that will enable us to express greater life, greater happiness, greater power without harm to anyone. Verses 41 and 42. David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. This means that after love receives the protecting power of the soul, it is able to come out of its hiding place in the subconscious, which means south, and make way for a closer union with the soul, the presence of God within, as symbolized by David kissing Jonathan. David bowed three times in recognition of the Trinity, God, Christ, and man, or mind, idea, and manifestation. The manifestation of the union of our soul, the presence of God within, is our oneness with God, which leads to the 42nd verse. The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed. This means through the deep understanding power of spirit, the soul is eternally unified with love. We were made from love. We were made to love and be loved. It is God's gift to us which is implanted within each one of us. Intrinsically, we know that we are one with all, and this is the reason why we can see the presence of God within all persons, things, and events. The divine love that is within us allows us to transcend the relative, shift from the ordinary to the extraordinary, move from mediocrity to excellence. We do not see differences, we see unity. There are no limitations to our judgment because love is spirit and love is perfect and limitless. Love harmonizes the entire universe. William March in his book, Your 12 Gifts from God, suggests that love is a spiritual ointment for chaos and confusion. We can direct love to a chaotic situation and harmony will be restored. Love also brings freedom. When we love someone, there is freedom to be. So therefore, the love automatically restores the natural harmony in the universe, and so balance and order is restored to any situation with anyone. To truly love a person, we see the truth about the person separating them from the exterior appearances, because there is no fear, because we can only experience love because Love is the foundation from which we speak. Love is truly our essence. It is what connects us all. Education, background, occupation, environment, skin color, orientation, shape, size, age, does not matter. We are spiritual beings first and foremost, and therefore as spirit is love, its creation was created out of love, for love, and to dwell in love. Let our consciousness shelter all those who we meet on our spiritual journey. Be a place in consciousness that blesses all beings in the cosmos. Let us appreciate each other. Every face is a face of God. And the soul of God looks through every pair of eyes that locks with ours. Another aspect of love is the art of listening to each other. In our foundation class, our first spiritual practice to be learned was the art of listening. Listening within, to God, to ourselves, listening to others, and listening to our bodies. That one was added by Dr. Sonia. But let us look at listening to others for today. And I quote, it has been said that the deepest need for most people is simply to be heard. In this context, being willing to listen patiently to others is a spiritual practice and a healing gift. To give the pure gift of listening, it is important to give up the need to comment, have an opinion, fix, or argue about anything that is being said. Remember that all people are divine, and all are entitled to their own individual perspective. Each person lives a life with unique experiences and perspectives. By being willing to listen, to simply listen to another, giving your full attention, looking them right in the eye, 
you will find that each is able to find their own way and sort out their own feelings in their own time. Listening with your heart in this manner is empowering for the other as you hold within your own being the idea that each person is powerful and has the power to know their own way. At the center of being, we are all one. Hear the voice of their truth. In this way, you will learn and experience another aspect of God and discover a new oneness with everyone around you." End of quote. With this new approach to each other, then it is easy to be gentle and kind to one another. Gentleness means being compassionate, being considerate, tolerant, calm, patient, courteous, and peaceful, being tender-hearted. As we offer these qualities to each other, others will respond exactly how you want to be treated. Ephesians 4, verse 32, and I quote, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, end of quote. Don't assume that others do not like to be appreciated or experience kindness. Let us move past assumptions and offer appreciation and thoughtfulness by giving compliments, a smile, a hug, a note of thanks, or expressing gratitude for anything given to us, even being a part of our spiritual journey. Calling persons by name. Take smiling, for instance. Always smile from the heart, sincerely, to everyone. It is infectious, a good feeling. Hugging is good, I am informed. It releases oxytocin. That is why we have a good feeling afterwards. You know that huggy huggy feeling when you have when you hug your friends after church? That's the reason why you feel good. The oxytocin that is released. Love is the answer to getting along with others as it allows always to see the divinity within. Even in the face of criticism, if there is truth in it, do something about it. If not, give thanks anyway that the person commented in this way for your well-being. Let us realize that even in our offices or homes, there's always the opportunity to serve each other and know that it is to the honor and glory of our Creator. Let us not remodel anyone, as each individual represents God in action and therefore necessary to the tapestry of the universe. So let us truly cultivate an attitude of love and friendship to all. Our lives will reflect to us enduring true relationships of love and appreciation. So in the, on this very special day, as we all celebrate the Christ's presence within each other, we can look with love and joy in their eyes, recognizing the beloved in each one. I close with Emerson. The essence of friendship is entireness, a total magnanimity and trust. It must not surmise or provide for infirmity. It treats its object as a god, that it may deify both." End of quote. I behold thee, sons and daughters of love. Namaste.